driver for us to do all what we can to protect nature and address environmental factors that can cause pandemics. But, and that's what we will be discussing today as well, this is not the only reason to act. We are seeing growing awareness that actually greater sustainability and nature-based solutions can help us to get out of this crisis. And nature can be a very strong ally in making our economy sustainably competitive and help us reduce the impact of climate change. So today we want to discuss about the state of play with our environment, the role for, role for ecosystems, uh, sm how smart use of resources and nature inspired solutions can play a role as we move forward and aim to address the multiple challenges we face. But we also want to talk about the policy tools and what we can do, be it under the EU's environmental agenda or with the other EU tools, as well as when we're discussing the recovery plans, the EU budget, uh, what we do next and how we approach the environment around us does matter. And we want to have a discussion around those tools, what we can do differently and better if we want to build a more resilient and sustainable economy and society. With these words, we're very pleased to have European Commissioner for Environment, Oceans and Fisheries, Virginia Sinkevich, is with us and start off. Tell us why does environment matter? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And of course, a very good morning to, to everybody. And thank you for this invitation. Uh, it's a truly great pleasure to be here with one of my predecessors, uh, Janesh Potochnik, uh, who has enormous experience in, in these matters. And Janesh is a great expert in circular economy, but he also led the EU delegation at CBD COP10 when the current uh, strategic plan for biodiversity was adopted. So we'll be listening to his advice very carefully. And I'm also very happy to only, of course, virtually, but uh, for the first time to meet Lynn uh, Gorison, an uh, innovation biologist with a profound interest and experience in uh, uh, in, 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 in this field. And I'm sure you will share with us uh, many useful insights of, of how we can learn from nature and its role for, for innovative solution uh, for our society. Today, uh, we are putting nature under uh, the microscope and looking at the implications of our policy responses. Uh, but I'm sure both Lean and Janesh will agree that it is very important to think in terms of whole systems and and how nature fits into a into our broader agenda when we look for the best reporting on the environment we go to the european environment agency the most recent overview the state and outlook report on the eu environment of 2020 has placed the biodiversity crisis in the context of all the challenges we currently face it underlines the need to address not just the nature crisis but also the climate crisis, the resources crisis, pollution crisis, and all at the same time, uh, they all present risks uh, to health, uh, well-being, uh, and environment, but also our economies, and ultimately, in the end of the day, our society as a whole. Uh, and I think they all need to be tackled together. If we try to tackle them in isolation, uh, we know we are going to fail, but we don't uh, want to fail. And this is why we have a unified response. That's the thinking of the von der Leyen Commission. And that's why we have the Green Deal. The idea is to deliver uh, landmark transformational actions to future proof our economy and safeguard well-being with policies that are more integrated than, than ever before. The golden rule is do no harm, and we follow that rule in everything we do. Circular economy action plan, zero pollution ambition, and the EU recovery plan. To deliver a, a, a resilient and, and sustainable future that leaves no one behind, uh, uh, this is the main, main aim. And, and this unified thinking was also a, a driving force behind uh, the EU biodiversity strategy to 2030. 
it's quite wrong to think of this strategy as just another plan for nature. I would call it a actually a central element in the EU recovery plan. More and more people are supportive of the idea that nature needs better protection for multiple reasons. If we want to build resilience in our society, if we want to reduce the likelihood of future outbreaks of zoonotic diseases, uh, then we need to do a much better job of prote protecting and restoring nature and reconciling uh, nature protection and restoration with economic development. And, and, and that's, why, uh, that's, that's what this strategy is designed to do. Uh, we want to expand protected areas and make sure they are better connected. We are restoring the damaged areas and ecosystems with legally binding restoration targets. And we are working with nature, using nature-based solutions to solve wider environmental, social, and economic problems. And these solutions are cost-effective and designed for, uh, for the long term. They create jobs and support green growth, and they can play an important role in building uh, a resilient recovery from, from the current pandemic, uh, because many of them are ready for use and they need uh, many different skills and, uh, of course, many hands to implement. Uh, the transition to sustainability is also uh, a huge economic opportunity. A few weeks ago, uh, an article in the Oxford Review of Economic Policy put natural capital investment, including restoration of carbon-rich uh, habitats, climate-friendly agriculture and sustainable tourism, as one of the five most important fiscal recovery policies because of the high economic multipliers and the positive climate impact. Uh, we still have time to do this, but the opportunity, the window of opportunity is, is closing. Uh, so we need to keep making this case very loud to the people that, that matter. It's time to be bold in our investments and implement nature-based solutions that will help uh, tackle uh, the planetary emergency. When we talk about a return to nature, uh, we are not being naive. Of course, we need to re-examine our relationship with the natural world. Uh, we need to remember that societies and economies are completely dependent on healthy and vibrant ecosystems for water, food, medicines, uh, clothes, energy, and of course, climate regulation. But we also know that returning to nature doesn't mean turning back the clock. What it also means is choosing technologies and solutions with much greater care, uh, design more resource efficient system, deploy new business models uh, that lead to resource conservation and regeneration led to less pollution. And we can no longer overlook the interdependencies between pollution, climate change, and biodiversity loss, and their uh, implications on health, well-being, and the economy. These challenges have to be addressed in an integrated manner with urgent uh, collaborative action. As environmentalists, uh, we can do this on our own. Uh, we can't do this on our own, uh, and, and, and we need transformative change for society as a whole, uh, from farmers, uh, foresters, uh, to people who design and manufacture products we consume, services we use, investors, public authorities, or scientists, citizens. And it's our mission to spread the, the word. Uh, if we don't change the system, we are putting serious limits on the options of our children, of our grandchildren. And we are increasing the risk of pandemics that can return in, in the future. None of us wants that. And it doesn't have to happen. And if we deliver on the context of, of, of new strategy for biodiversity, but also the circular economy action plan, it won't happen. The biodiversity strategy will ensure that we aren't just returning to nature. We are allowing nature to return. And that is the future uh, we really need. And I think uh, this planet deserves. Uh, thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, and thank you for talking about these interlinkages and the need for that 
bigger system-wide change because it is obviously very important to keep in mind that we are not here only talking about environment and protection of nature for the sake of it but that actually it does link to this bigger picture and the bigger crisis that we are facing at the moment and that we do need that integrated approach and with these uh, words it provides a per perfect bridge uh, for our next speaker uh, for Janis Potocznik when we talk about rethinking our existing economic model, uh, what would be some of your key messages um, that we should consider? Thank you. Thank you, Annika, Virginius, Lean, dear friends. I will share some very quickly. And uh, uh, I have 10 minutes for the story to tell. Return to nature, the solution to our crisis driven times. So, for the first time in human history, we face the emergence of a single tightly coupled human socio-ecological system of planetary scope. If we don't understand that during these times, we will never understand it. We are more interconnected, more interdependent than ever, and our individual and collective responsibility has thus enormously increased. We have all heard about safe operating space, uh, the donut, which has in the inside part uh, basis human needs, including minimum requirements of resource supply, and on the outer, the limits of planetary boundaries. And we have also all heard that some of these planetary boundaries are currently already overshooted. And one of them, the one to which we are today focusing on, it's of course linked to biodiversity loss. According to Living Planet Index, uh, we have had 60% fall in just 40, 40 years, uh, last 40 years of living species. And according to IPBS, biomass of the mammals living in the nature has been reduced in recent decades for 82%. The Club of Rome has nicely summarized the story by saying that we have from so-called empty world, which was dominated by nature, to the full world, which is dominated by humans. While in the empty world, it was the labor and infrastructure which were the limiting factors of human well-being, in the full world, it is actually the natural resources and environmental sinks which are the limiting factors of human well-being. Which is normally used when we try to, from a scientific point of view, analyze the questions which are linked to environment. It's called DPSIR. D drivers, P pressures, S state, and I, I impacts and R response. Unfortunately, with our policy, we are normally in the state and impact uh, attention. When we talk about climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, we basically talk about consequences. Immediately, when we start to talk about drivers and pressures, we talk about humans and human activity. And the connecting link is actually how we use our natural resources, because they are decisive on one hand for the effectiveness, and on the other hand, the irresponsible use of these natural resources is actually causing biodiversity loss, pollution, and so on. Why that is important? Because the policies are different. So if we agree that we have to go to the roots, let's focus on our economy. Maybe the best could be explained what is the real problem in our economic world on this slide. It is based on Inclusive Wealth Index, which was presented by United Nations in 2018. Inclusive Wealth Index has three components. One is the production capital. That's the dotted line, the gray dotted line. It's production capital per capita. The second is human capital per capita, the blue dotted line. And the third is natural capital per capita the green dotted line. What was happening in the last 20 years and a bit more? We are seeing that the production capital, which is actually very much the synonym of gross domestic product, GDP, because this is GDP, which is growing pretty much on the same line as production capital per capita, was, has almost doubled. Natural capital, that's the, uh, that's the blue uh, dotted line, has increased for a few percent, while in that period, per capita has almost decreased for 40%. So the conclusion that the growth of GDP in the past decades has been achieved at the cost of depleting natural capital, it's actually not so difficult. 
or if we put it in economic terms, since we live in market economies and we know that producers, consumers apparently behave rationally, it means that the most important thing which we get are the signals normally according to the price, and those signals are sending us in the direction that the production capital is overvalued, that the human capital is undervalued, and that natural capital is in many cases not valued at all. So if somebody believes that we will live in economic, social, and environmental balance while we are sending those capital, those signals on the markets which are currently something which is decisive for our consumption and production behavior, we are simply terribly mistaken. What would be needed? It's an economic system which would be function of the ecosystem. And the most important part of that is, of course, environmental externalities. And I'm pretty sure that Virginius will in his mandate hear many times that he cannot introduce that and that measure because this is additional cost for the business sector. In essence, this is a totally wrong assumption. Those costs are already existing. We simply don't account for them. We deny them. We privatize the profits and we socialize the cost. This is, in short, the economic story. Let me now move to the question which we have addressed through the National Resource Panel. When we looked uh, to the environmental impacts in the value chain only in the resource extraction and processing phase, so not in the use phase. The first conclusion was that 90% of global biodiversity loss and water stress could be accounted to that, 50% of global climate change, and even one third of the air pollution, which means if you are buying a car, not using it and parking it for the whole life, you have already caused one third of the air pollution because the resources has to be extracted and the car needs to be produced. But let's look a bit more closely where the major problem when it comes to biodiversity loss actually lies. Biomass, metals, non-metallic minerals, fossil fuels. I don't have time to go into details, but if we just look to the biomass, over 85% of biomass is causing the problems related to global water stress. And over 80% of global land use related biodiversity loss, it's also linked to the biomass, which means if you want to solve these issues, you have to focus on the biomass, on the questions which are linked to our forestry, but in particular to the things which are linked to the management of our land, agriculture, food production, and questions which are there causing the problems of the biodiversity loss. The concept which we are defending in the European, in the International Resource Panel, is that our well being and our economic activity growth should certainly be decoupled from the resource use and both should be decoupled from the environmental impacts. If this is not done, actually we are running our economic system to the wall, which we will hit sooner than later. Green Deal, it's based, as you know, on the circular economy. And circular economy should be seen as an instrument for delivering this decoupling of economic growth from resource use and environmental impacts. Actually, I consider it as part of the bigger picture of economic, societal, cultural transformation, which is needed if you want to live in a system which is uh, consistent with sustainable development goals. The general orientation of the Green Deal, the most important sentence which you will find there, it's, it is a new growth strategy. It actually and period till which we have seen economic development and environmental protection in contradiction. Now, after the introduction of the European Green Deal, we can see it in a consistent way, which is for me the most important part which actually the Green Deal has brought. It's also talking about need to protect, conserve, enhance European Union natural capital, protect health, well-being of citizens from environment, related risks and impacts, and this must be transition which is just and inclusive. And it's also putting everything in the global context in implementing the UN's 2030 agenda and the SDGs. And when I'm mentioning the global context, and since Virginius already mentioned also the COP in Nagoya 2010, where I was participating, just to remind you with few sentences what was actually happening at that moment. It was a COP which was after 2000 and FCC, which was seen as a major failure 
of multilateralism. So agreements in Nagoya actually brought again some optimism and new hope into the multilateralism. The strategic plan for biodiversity was adopted, 1120, including, as you know, Aichi biodiversity targets. Nagoya protocol on access and benefit sharing was also an important thing which was evolved there. And two, late, two years later in Hyderabad, 2012, we have also adopted implementation of the strategy for resource mobilization. But as you know, targets and commitments are the easy part. We cannot assume that because ability is currently on the map, a return to nature, the solution to our crisis-driven times will actually happen. We should rather make sure that other commissioners, ministers, DGs, companies, and I can continue, actually know how to read this map. What is needed is an effective integration into policies that define the way we work, the way we travel, the way we consume. For example, clear conditionality in investment, funding, and procurement, economic incentive, tax sanction, and I could continue and continue. What is the most for me, COVID-19 basic lesson? Many are saying that the world after COVID-19 will not be the same again. I firmly believe it will be exactly the same. We will hopefully just understand it better. Very likely the frequency and severity of health-related outbreaks, climate-related extreme weather events will in the future increase. So we need to rethink the way we are managing our risks as individuals, collectively, private companies, public policymakers, locally, globally, because we have to focus and increase the resilience and our preparedness. And just to remind you that we have a precautionary principle even written in European Union treaties, and that may be walking on a more safe side when we are implementing it in practice, it's not so bad idea. We can see today that it can save our, jive, or our jobs if we do not consider that our lives are the most important thing in the world. I believe that European Green Deal and the post-COVID recovery are two sides of the same coin from the five reasons. First, because economic policy designed in Green Deal is the most convincing competitiveness policy for European Union. European Union is import dependent when it comes to energy, critical resources, the share of uh, uh, materials in overall costs in manufacturing industry, it's increasing. Prices on the long term are increasing. They are at least volatile. And we are socially based continent, which really appreciate that uh, this relation to the social policies is it's so high on political agenda. Second, some are calling for reconsidering globalization, as you know, and I can out that already by introducing circular economy, we are lowering our dependency from many of the imports which I mentioned before, and that many of the new jo jobs which are connected to circular economy are actually very much local jobs. Third, in Green Deal was actually bringing uh, a kind of recognition that we have indebted future generations by depleting natural capital. And post-COVID recovery will, is bringing on the table a lot of financial indebtedness. Also for the future generations, we can simply not leave future generations with all environmental and economic debts without giving them a promise and a solution of a better world than the world in which we are currently living. COVID-19 has also provided a necessary missing urgency, additional, uh, uh, an, uh, an amount of, of financial uh, support which we have never seen before. And we have an ideal opportunity that we use it for double purpose. If we miss this opportunity, I'm a bit afraid that in next decade there will not be another one. And finally, both are also showing that we need more cooperation on a global level. And if we don't do that, that we need more of the sharing sovereignty. If we don't do that, that actually all of us collectively suffer. So do not harm should be based on clear conditions, clear taxonomy. The importance of nature-based solutions to our economy. Commission said that invest called nature-based solutions offers multiple opportunities to unlock new revenue streams, to increase societal engagement, 
protecting ecosystems and biodiversity should be understood as an essential ingredient for building the potential capacity of circular bioeconomy. It's not only blue with yellow stars, it's rainbow, blue for and democracy, red for social values, green for protection of environment, yellow for the culture. We can hardly picture that Europe would be economically the center of the world, but we should do everything that Europe remains the center of the dreams of all the people of the world. There has never been a better moment in Europe's history to move from the history of resource-driven imperialism, if I can say so, into an era of responsible use of natural resources, mitigating our resource fragility, strengthening preparedness and resilience. This would also clearly position European Green Deal and implementing documents and give them a real historic and strategic weight. This is the last slide. Johann Wolfgang Goethe said, knowing it's not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. We are currently in the knowing and willing phase. We should move. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this overview. I think that uh, it's it's a lot to take in because there it's such a major transformation that we need to go through. But it's great how you highlighted the importance that this is really the occasion to adopt new thinking and that the Green Deal does provide us a very valuable basis to build on. And when you were talking about the importance of nature-based solutions, uh, this provides a great uh, bridge to our next speaker, uh, Lynn Gorison, uh, founder at Studio Transition um, and an author of a book on natural intelligence. You've been looking at nature-inspired innovation as a key to health and wealth. So it would be very interesting to hear from you um, how you see nature providing solutions um, to the crisis of today. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you so much, Annika. Let me share my presentation. So I hope it's working now. Thank you all for inviting me to take you onto a journey into how nature inspired innovation can help us achieve a healthier, wealthier and more viable post COVID world. I would like to start uh, with a few words on why we are not such good engineers, uh, designers and managers as we think we are. Today, our entire industrial system performs at less than 10% efficiency. That means that 90% of resources are wasted along the way. Our food system consumes 10 times more energy than it provides us. And soon we will have more plastic in the ocean than fish. On top of this, innovation as usual leads to a climate that is unfriendly to life. These are just a few examples to show that our logic of value creation leads to degradation. It is out of sync with the way life works. So we need a new paradigm for innovation. One that starts not from artificial, but from natural intelligence. Because nature has been dealing with change and disruption for 3.8 billion years. What this means is the, depicted in this image. If we summarize the entire history of the Earth into one calendar year, then all of human history would take place in the last half hour of the last day. The Industrial Revolution would take place in the last two seconds before midnight. So as relative novices on the Earth, therefore, our biggest challenge is to avoid joining the 99.9% .9 of species that once inhabited the earth, but are now extinct. So what the world needs the most right now is natural intelligence. It's about the logic that stood the test of time. Because we now know that wolves change rivers, that whales cool the climate. In fact, a study from the International Monetary Fund shows that restoring the whale populations to their pre-whaling numbers is the most effective solution we have to halt climate change. Science also recently discovered that Arctic foxes green the tundra, that fungi make rain, and that plankton cr create clouds when the sun burns too hot. These are just a few examples that illustrate that the life that prevails 
over millions of years of selection is the life that creates conditions conducive to life. Imagine what we can achieve if we once again learn to align innovation with the way it works. If we learn to become self-renewing right where we are. That is the essence of natural intelligence. It banks on a for life value logic instead of a for profit one. Because the current pandemic shows us the brittleness of a for profit value logic in a for life selection environment. To rebuild our world for the better, the question that we should be exploring today is how we can innovate in a way that is beneficial to life. Here are a few principles that can show us the way. The first one is to shift to bio-inspired innovation. That way we can build the future on millions of years of field tests. Why bio-inspired? Because going against the ways in which life works is inherently inefficient. It costs energy, resources, health and spirit. For instance, can we learn from sharks how to prevent viral and bacterial contamination of surfaces so that there is no need to use harmful detergents? Well, a company called Sharklet Technologies is developing thin films that mimic the properties of the shark skin to reduce the transference of germs through microstructure instead of chemicals. The germs can simply no longer attach themselves to surfaces, so there's no need for disinfectants or for antibiotics. A second principle is that innovation needs to be logic to, towards life, for it is only an investment if it leaves the world better off. Why is this important? Because sustainability is the byproduct of regeneration, and if it's not sustainable, it's terminal. So how can we learn from nature how to become self-renewing right where we are? For one, by becoming masters in design for disassembly. For example, the new Triodos headquarters in the Netherlands have been designed to be completely reusable. All the parts can be reused when the lifetime of the building is over. Another feature of NI is that it builds on the increasing amount of science that proves that nature not only makes us healthier, she makes us smarter and happier too. Applying these insights to our living environment is called biophilia. This matters because our inner and outer nature are connected. So can we, instead of designing nature out, learn to design nature in into our urban habitats, like this example in the city of Genk in Belgium? Can we come up with alternatives for yet another shopping district, like this example from Bueri Architects, who designed a smart forest city that houses 7.5 million plants? The fourth principle of NI is that all chemistry in nature is biocompatible and biodegradable. This is important because, because if it ain't life friendly, it perpetuates toxicity. If it's not life friendly, it is not circular at all. So can we learn from nature how to make life friendly chemistry? Here is a game-changing insight from the pioneers from Biomimicry 3.8 who illustrate that nature uses only a small subset of the elements of the periodic table to build the millions of creatures and organisms that roam the earth. For instance, can we learn from mussels how to create non-toxic and waterproof superglue? like the company called Columbia Forest Products that mimics the muscle's chemistry to create formaldehyde-free plywood. Another principle of nature is that it balances feedback loops and it works with what is locally available. This matters because life always builds from the bottom up and in a circular fashion. Everything is food and nothing is wasted. So can we learn from nature how to restore the vital feedback loops that keep life alive? 
can we learn from nature how to draw down carbon? A pioneer in sustainability that reduced its footprint to almost zero by learning from nature, the carpet tile manufacturer and multinational called Interface, has developed a new mission which they call Climate Take Back. This mission aims to create a climate that is fit for life. One of their groundbreaking innovations is a carpet that stores carbon. So after the carpet is made, there is less carbon in the atmosphere. And last but not least, and it has been mentioned before, a very important principle is that we need to learn to think in systems because everything on this planet is linked. An important rule that guarantees that life can stay alive is therefore invest in the health of others to ensure your own. That is important because you are an ecosystem. There are more non-human cells inside your body than human cells. And it takes an ecosystem to sustain an ecosystem. So can we learn from nature how to create healthy, productive land management approaches so that we can regenerate our agricultural and garden wastelands? This is a picture of my personal garden regeneration project, which you can see on the right. By using nature-inspired design, we are building an edible yet natural landscape. Neighboring our garden is a maize monoculture. It's an ecological dead zone. Our garden looked like the maize field when we started. There was not much life. Now we have more than 60 different species of animals that visit the garden, some of which are quite rare, like the black woodpecker or the hummingbird hawk moth. So to conclude, once you understand how life works, you will see that sustainability is the byproduct of regenerative value creation. In other words, nature's blueprint for innovation is regeneration. It's a biological process of renewal that leads to a higher order of health, wealth, vitality, and viability. In short, nature works. And adopting this intelligence in both policy making and business innovation will help us to fast forward into a healthier, wealthier, and more viable future. For the nature of the future and the future of nature are interdependent. More stories are shared in my book, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. It's been great to hear from all of you and to get this urgency and the the story of this big story, the narrative and that we often tend to ignore. And um, I'll be happy to come back to the panelists um, to hear your reactions to each other, but also in that we do see that in the general picture, um, there is this tendency not to value and recognize the importance of ecosystem services, the nature around us. And now we are amidst the biggest economic crisis um, in, in a long, long time, where we see that actually environment and what we do with our environment has enormous impact. Our agriculture system, construction, the food sector, all of these depend on ecosystem services. So what would be your key messages? How can we bring about that change that is needed? What needs to change with, for policymakers, businesses, people to see the value of nature and to adopt this bigger thinking? Um, and please feel free to comment on each other's presentations as well. Thank you. And Commissioner Sinkevichus, you want to go first? Sure. sure. Thank you very much, of course, first of all, for very interesting, uh, interesting presentations. and. Uh, uh, I agree with all the issues uh, that Janes raised. Uh, I think sustainability is the only viable option for a, for a future proof uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, and for a future in prosperity. And I think we know uh, what we have to do. The question is, what do we do it uh, in, in, uh, in the time available? Uh, and time is very limited. That's the most important part. And nature 
is at this moment nature is the timekeeper uh, there will be no bailouts with nature we will not be able to self-isolate from climate change or biodiversity loss simply uh, the species extinctions are forever uh, they are not reversible so we need deep rapid and transformative change from trade and production to our consumption and lifestyles if we do not change the ways we produce, consume, and trade. Uh, a change in climate and deteriorating uh, ecosystem will soon put limitations on our uh, options for well-being, prosperity, and development. And I think uh, what the period we currently living is a good uh, is a good wake-up call for everything that we shouldn't take everything everything for granted. Uh, things we, which may be looked uh, that nobody can take uh, from you uh, your visit to 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 a mother or or a, or a shopping activity. It's changed. It changed dramatically. So that should be a, a wake up call. And uh, speaking regarding lean, uh, I think as as said in my initial intervention, the transition to sustainability is an opportunity, and we need to learn from and we need to learn and and and, and we need to work uh, with nature and in nature nothing is wasted the circular economy is exactly inspired by this principle the eu policies go in the direction of promoting nature-based solutions including uh -huh. and we propose to unlock 20 billion uh, uh, a year for spending on nature more over as, as as nature restoration will make a major contribution to climate objectives, a significant proportion of, of water, 25% of the EU budget dedicated to climate action will be invested in uh, biodiversity and nature-based solutions. And, and in order to effectively spend this money, we need to actively engage member states and businesses. And uh, for this, uh, the current taxonomy regulation, I think is very well designed and it, it, it can be and, and must be an essential tool. And from the policymakers' perspective, we also need to make sure our assessment models uh, properly value benefits to society and the environment alongside, of course, economic, economic value. Thank you very much. Um, Janis Potocznik um, Lee Gorison, either one of you wants to jump in? Yep, very quickly. Uh, I, I also very. Uh, both what uh, what Virginius is saying and uh, the presentation of Lean was simply fascinating, and uh, only thing which I would really um, which which I don't see so much present, but it was in the past uh, already somehow pushed ahead is that we need to return to the basics. We we need to go to the causes. We need to go to the the levels because our compass, it's simply broken and it's sending us in the wrong direction. I have normally said that GDP, brut, GDP, it's a kind of um, the best, how you explain GDP is you will not reach your goal by walking faster if you are walking in the wrong direction. And that's exactly what, uh, what GDP is it's saying. It was, uh, it's actually not measuring the well-being and uh, until we have this kind of compass, until we do not recognize all the costs and uh, in, in, the, uh, in the business sector as being part of, the, of something which is influencing on our lives. And since we are, we are working and, and buying and, and selling in the, in the market economies, until we don't really deal with those uh, core signals, we will have the problem none of the policy laws and so on will be able to remedy that so uh, i'm i will always say that we have to go to the basics and second thing which is connected to the lean's presentation uh, it was so simple it was so logical and so that uh, it's uh, it's really amazing whenever i try to explain exactly the same story as you try to explain lean i'm basically saying that uh, circular economy, which, you know, I was pushing very much, it's circular bio-based economy. It's actually the oldest concept on the earth, 
because mm -hmm. uh, the earth is functioning in the way that nothing is lost and everything has its purpose. What was actually exactly the story which you shared? I, I even, I, what, what we would need as humans, it's uh, uh, that we are part of nature and we have a problem. If that we are more intelligent and we rule the nature. And whenever we have had that kind of problem, I'm normally finishing my presentation by the quote of the most famous Belgian, Hercule Poirot, who was once asked why, uh, why he is speaking about himself always in the third person. And his reply was, if somebody is so intelligent like I am, you have to establish certain distance towards yourself. So that's the humanity's problem. We have to establish certain distance towards ourselves. And if we truly believe that we are so intelligent, as you said it at the end, if we want to care for ourselves, let's care for the others. And Lee? Yes, thank you. Um, I very, very much align with uh, what um, both presenters um, um, Janis and Virginia share, have shared before, and I guess it's actually quite simple. There are two enablers um, if we would really put them to use, and not just in a symbolic way, but really in, in, pra in a practical, actual matter. Um, if we stop incentivizing degradation and instead incentivize regeneration, policy could help us really fast forward. But we also, um, like Jana said, we need to, uh, to work on education so that we can get rid of this illusion that humans are separate from nature. So we need to teach the way that life works uh, in all disciplines, in engineering, in business, education, in chemistry, and so forth. And I think those two can be very strong enablers for us to move forward. Thank you very much. Um, we have one question from the audience on, um, on how to manage the non-circle economy. I hope that I understand the question right. And that uh, when transitioning to circular economy, will this actually then mean that we'll see enormous amounts of resources being required to the economy to actually get into that non-circular economy? I hope that I understood the question right. Um, another question I would like to put forward to you is that we see as part of the recovery discussions at the moment, a lot of emphasis being put to the renovation wave. And obviously, this can be an enormous opportunity, but there are obviously risks involved as well. So what would you like to see happening in the context of this discussion that we're seeing and also money being put in to major renovation projects where the focus at the moment is a lot on energy efficiency, but arguably, obviously, green infrastructure, nature based solutions, um, also for adaptation, etc., could play a role. So very happy to hear your thoughts and what you think should be principles um, as the discussion on the renovation wave continues. Who would like to go first? <laughs> I can I can begin maybe shortly then addressing because I see we are very short on time so yes. uh, I guess uh, I would leave some time for for for, for Janish and and, and him. but uh, maybe shortly on on the circular economy under the circular economy uh, area actions will first of all supporting uh, uh, support adopting more circular uh, product designs uh, uh, because most of the goods uh, we're using, including textiles, um, they are pre-designed in, 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 in the already design stage for how long we're going to use and even what impact it's going to have uh, on nature later on. So I think the most important stage which we are going to tackle is, of course, is going to be uh, design stage, through widening the eco design stage for making uh, consumers to make uh, informative uh, choices uh the uh the actions will also cover supportive policy measures uh and of course uh demonstrate systemic solutions for for the territorial deployment of the circular economy uh it is very important that we there is no secret that we have in europe 
uh, member states who are very ambitious and very far advanced with, with the implementation of the circular economy practices and those who are maybe less ambitious, but uh, this transition has to take all on board. Thank you. Very circular economy where I see the major problems. First of all, uh, 10 people understand circular economy in 10 different ways. So we would first need to agree what we understand under the circular economy. But I think what is essential is that we develop a system, create a system which would incentivize producers and consumers to save resources instead of use resources, spend them in a very rational way in many cases. So we have a massive underutilization because producer is not connected to the product after he sees the product at all. So he doesn't have any incentive to, as, as Virginius said, to basically design the product in a resource efficient way because there is no value retained and he doesn't see any value of that that he would or that he would design the business model differently, that he would design the the differently because he is detached from waste and from the use phase. And uh, that it's one thing when you look at it from the producer side. When you look at it from the consumer side, you know, we have many unused houses, uh, cars, uh, I don't know, clothes, whatever, because we are simply bound to consumption and we are driven, the whole system is driven through the quantity driven logic. And, uh, but in the end, humans, do not need, I don't know, light bulbs. We need light. We don't need cars. We need mobility. We don't need, uh, I don't know, refrigerators. We need cool and fresh uh, food. We don't need pesticides. We need uh, a field which is protected in the best way, in natural way against the pests. So that logic should be more integrated. Of course, this ownership, which is based on, uh, or with, which is connected with, with that, it's uh, a problem. But with the young generation, which is not so much ownership biased like our generation and providing them alternative solutions, I think we can move uh, very much ahead. If you are selling the light bulbs, your profit is made on the number of light bulbs. If you are selling light, your number of light bulbs which you use are your costs. So the system is upside down and you create something which is totally different. So and. Uh, when it comes to uh, renovation, the only thing which I would say is uh, uh, you have to be aware that the way how we are to, today approaching to, to battle climate change, it's actually very limited. Energy, it's truly very important, but we are leaving out of the battle an important amount of nature-based solutions and an important amount of uh, uh, non-energy related resources, like how we manage land, how we manage water, how we manage materials and so on. And if we would really unite those, I would say, uh, uh, supply, demand and nature-based solutions, we would certainly get much better and more effective solutions in policy making than we have today. Thank you very much. Len? <laughs> Okay, I'll try to keep it short. Um, in terms of the, the first question about the circular economy, well, I would turn the question upside down and say, actually, we have a huge resource called carbon uh, that is currently not, re not used. So imagine what we can do with that huge resource potential for a circular economy. And then in terms of the building environment, well, three steps are very important. First, we have to stop to eat nature uh, for our developments. Second, we have to fade out what's not life friendly. And third, we have to build in a nature inclusive and nature based way so that we use uh, the solutions that have been working for millions of years um, and integrate them into our living environments. Thank you very much. I'm very much aware that we're running out of time and there would have been so many other issues would have been great to discuss with you, um, including obviously the global context, um, because we are obviously only one of the players and uh, we do need to get others on board as well. But luckily, we will have plenty other discussions uh, taking place at EPC, so hopefully we'll be able to 
touch upon these topics um, in the future as well. Thank you so much for joining the discussion and highlighting um, the urgency for action and the systemic problems in our present economic model and also what needs to be changed. Um, I think that the discussion we've had has clearly shown that we can make nature an ally and what we should probably do even more is that we should innovate like nature and use nature as an inspiration for addressing the major challenges with, that we face. And there are uh, obviously very number of extremely important uh, initiatives, plans um, happening at the moment and the EU level uh, recovery plans, uh, as well as the circle economy action plan, the follow up to that, etc. We will continue to follow these very with a close interest and hope to engage in that debate and so wish you all the best with um, these developments uh, and let's keep that discussion going. For everyone who is interested, we ourselves at EPC were organizing, um, I would pick three discussions that could be of interest to you. On Monday, we're organizing a policy dialogue with EIP on realizing the ambition of the European Green Deal. On 2nd of July, we're organizing a discussion on towards a sustainable food system. Is the EU's farm to fork strategy up to the task? Do join. As well as on 14th of July, we're organizing a discussion on the Green Deal, the basis for a green recovery, together with the executive vice president for European Commission, Franz Timmermans. So the discussion goes on. We want to be part of this. And we really agree with you that this is the moment in time to bring about that change and that new thinking. And let's continue that work. Thank you so much uh, for all of you for joining and for our participants for listening in and tuning in and wishing you all a very nice uh, afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.